Let's move on to the next speaker, Kyle Kramer, who's an associate professor at New York University, and he's going to be talking about the future for particle physics. Go ahead, Kyle. So, um, well, thank you for uh, staying till the end, and it's been a, it's been a long day. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, sort of the intersection of physics, AI, and, and computing. Um, the, in terms of, you know, what I decided to talk about, uh, I got some input from Phil and looked at the goals for the workshop. And, you know, uh, part of the point there was really to try to focus on good applications of physics and AI that can benefit from the uh, recent computing development. So I'm going to try to focus on, you know, on sort of, you know, uh, AI topics that really have like a computing uh, uh, bent to them. Um, so, um, so I guess my pitch that I would say is that I think, you know, obviously many scientific problems uh, are around that call for some sort of extreme scale computing. Um, and there's various approaches to how to, you know, uh, to tackle that. Uh, so one is to not necessarily change your methodology or algorithms, but essentially to throw more computing at the problem. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I mean, it's an it's a obvious approach that you should uh, take. Um, sometimes it's the only option. And also it requires a lot of, you know, uh, you know, work on software to be able to leverage those computing resources. So that's, you know, that's a, I'm imagining like a, a large fraction of the, of the talks uh, at this workshop. Um, and then obviously there's, there, there's, you know, a lot of attention that we've seen, you know, in the last few talks about uh, trying to modify the code to be able to exploit new computing architectures like GPUs and TPUs and FPGAs or other types of, you know, uh, uh, computing architectures. But what I'm going to focus on is not so much on that side, but sort of um, alternative strategies to try to actually reduce the computing demands. Um, and they, and so, so there's sort of four themes, I guess, that I'll try to hit on. Um, one are more sample efficient uh, learning algorithms uh, that try to use data augmentation or novel loss functions. The second is a more efficient use of simulators um, by taking advantage of something called probabilistic programming and active learning. Um, and then I'll talk about more efficient optimization of scientific pipelines uh, by kind of adopting this differentiable programming uh, uh, paradigm. And then <clears throat> At the end, I'll talk about more sample efficient learning due to uh, inductive bias in the models. It's like incorporating physics into the models. And uh, so, I mean, we've heard a lot of these themes already, so I'm just going to kind of give a few examples of those. Uh, I'll be uh, talking pretty quickly, and then I'll kind of come back to the end of this. But the main point I would say also here is that th these approaches really require some deep integration of uh, the software, the computing, and the methodology. So it's not really like factorized into, you know, one camp or the other. Um, so a lot of the work that I've been doing recently, I've tried to put in the uh, framing of what, what's called uh, simulation-based inference or likelihood-free inference. And the idea here is that you have a, <clears throat> a simulator, which is kind of where your physics knowledge goes. And that could be either describing particle collisions or neuroscience or epidemiology or gravitational lensing or the evolution of the universe. Um, but you have some like well-motivated mechanistic model that, that uh, you're using to describe the data. And, uh, and you would like maybe like to try to infer the parameters of your theory that, that are like the parameters of the simulator uh, based on actual, you know, observed data. And that inverse problem is very challenging. Um, and so if you think of sort of this is a review paper that we wrote recently, and sort of have two, uh, you know, axes. The horizontal axis is essentially like the simulator cost or the dimensionality of the thing you're trying to infer, um, and then uh, the vertical axis is essentially the dimensionality of the data that you're working with. Um, and traditional simulation-based inference methods basically, excuse me, uh, sort of we're down here in the bottom left, and what we're seeing is that you know machine learning is allowing us to work with higher dimensional data. Active learning is allowing us to uh, work with kind of more expensive simulators and higher dimensional uh, inference problems. And kind of along the diagonal here, there's this uh, you know effort to kind of uh, integrate or augment the the uh, the simulators and the scientific pipelines, uh, which is somehow somewhere in the middle. So I'll, I'll kind of hit on these different things. So in this uh, review, we we kind of have a taxonomy for different approaches to this uh, simulation-based inference problem, and uh, you know roughly there's kind of two broad approaches: one in which you use the simulator directly, but you need to figure out how to use it much more efficiently. And so one example that fits in that is probabilistic programming, and I'll talk about that in just a little bit. 
Um, and the other uh, broad set of approaches are where you might use something like uh, neural networks to try to learn a simulator or a, sur a surrogate for your simulator, um, and that you'll try to use that. Um, so in this review, we, we have these flow charts, which I'm not going to go through, but that, that breakdown that I just described, the top row uh, is basically this kind of where you use the simulator directly and you try to do it, use it more efficiently. And the bottom row is where you're using things like neural networks uh, to learn some sort of surrogate and use that for trying to do inference. And in this, uh, these all these different uh, flow charts, part of what I want to highlight is that you see the presence of uh, the green boxes are like learning strategies. So you see both unsupervised and supervised learning. Um, you the yellow uh, sort of triangles are uh, the simulator, and you see that sometimes we have these augmented simulators that can do something more than just sort of produce synthetic data. Um, and you also see the presence of active learning uh, in different parts of the of the inference loop. Um, so I'm going to talk first uh, just very briefly about these uh, uh, approaches where you have a neural network based surrogate. Um, so here's a very high level schematic of kind of how it works. Um, you have a simulator, the simulator, you, you give it some parameters that you want to simulate. So these would be things like, you know, cosmological constant or mass of particles or something like that. Um, and inside the simulator, there's all sorts of, you know, detailed simulation is going to happen. And that's going to be sort of captured by these latent variable Z. These are things you wouldn't be able to observe in real data, but they happen inside of your simulator. And then your simulator outputs some observation X, which should look like your real data. And the, the idea here is we're going to use a neural network not to try to classify or something like that, but to try to, the, the network is gonna take in data and the value of the parameters. And it's going to try to approximate a likelihood or a likelihood ratio that depends on both the data and the parameters. And once you learn this, then you can do inference on your parameters. And so it's kind of a two-step process and it's amortized, meaning that this learning stage might be kind of uh, expensive, but once you've learned, uh, the inference part is fast. Okay, so one thing that we realized recently was that we can, you know, we can extract more from the simulators. We don't just have to work with uh, uh, this uh, uh, observed data. We can uh, we can extract these kinds of quantities, which I'm here calling uh, the joint uh, uh, likelihood ratio and the joint score. I'm not really going to go into details for them, but I'll just give you a kind of a quick feel. So if here's like a dummy simulator where I, I'm trying to like uh, simulate, you know, uh, well, you know, this 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 thing I have on my desk, and uh, and so these balls are falling through this uh, lattice of nails, and you can think of basically, you know, the observable is just like what bin do you land in the bottom, and uh, and so I want to you know predict the probability distribution for which bin you land in, and all the stuff that's happening inside the simulator, you know, the the balls bouncing around are these latent variables. Now the the distribution about where you land is uh, is involves this intractable integral here. We have to integrate over all the possible paths that you get there. Um, but if you think about following one particular ball, uh, that is you know whether or not it bounces to the left or right on each particular you know uh, time is something that is more tractable. So these kinds of quantities you can actually extract from the simulator. And then the question is, what can you do with them? So uh, basically, here's an example of a learning problem where the red curve is essentially the thing that we're trying to learn. Um, and the training data before would have been these like blue dots and green dots. And trying to learn, you know, the red curve from the blue dots and green dots sounds kind of difficult, but uh, you know, you could do it, but it's hard. And what this augmented data looks like is more like this. You know, it's it's kind of scattered around the red curve. And this is obviously going to be a much easier learning problem than the thing on the left. And this uh, other quantity that we can extract is kind of like the tangent vector along this curve. So you get all these little arrows and you can put it together to have this very rich kind of training data. And so one of the things we had to do was figure out how to use it. And so that was not so obvious, but we came up with some loss functions or like, you know, extended kinds of loss functions that can take advantage of this augmented data. And the result of that was uh, here you see an estimation error, essentially how well are we approximating the likelihood ratio as a function of the number of training samples from our simulator. And you see before we needed something like 10 million uh, simulated events or you know, a million to 10 million simulated events to do a good job on this particular problem. And with this augmented data, note this is a logarithmic scale, we can use something like 10,000 events and do basically just as well. Um, so this is like, you know, orders of magnitude more efficient in terms of uh, of learning. And that's like important from the point of view of computing, right? 
Um, and then in terms of physics impact, uh, you know, this is like, a, you know, examples for like studying the Higgs boson, this, ax this horizontal axis is some parameter and the curves are uh, log likelihood curves. And so you want them to be kind of tight and narrow. Um, and what you see is going from traditional techniques to these new techniques is like adding 90% more LHC data. Um, and over on the right is a different example where there's two different parameters we would like to measure. And what you see is that going from traditional techniques to these techniques, you see, you know, what a dr dramatic improvement in sensitivity that would be like improving the LHC data by several factors. So we've also used these kinds of techniques in, in, uh, in uh, dark matter uh, uh, astrophysics, where we're looking at uh, gravitational lenses and trying to understand the properties of dark matter substructure. Um, and this is relevant because uh, surveys like LSST and Euclid are going to be delivering many uh, galaxy, galaxy strong lenses, uh, hopefully in the near future. Um, and so if in this situation, we imagine what we want to infer are the, the population level parameters that describe the distribution of, of uh, dark matter uh, subhalos as a function of the mass of those subhalos. And so we can draw from that, that distribution and we can stick it into a simulator of that whole lensing pipeline. Uh, and these little blue dots are like all the sub, you know, dark matter subhalos. And we can include you know, uh, the, the point spread function and, and Poisson statistics and things like that. And we get out images that are like simulated images of these, uh, of these uh, lens systems. So we have the simulator, we would like to invert it. But what we need is something that's going to be able to, uh, you know, uh, operate quickly because we're going to bring in, you know, many such uh, 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 lenses. We need to be able to, you know, uh, deal with very subtle effects and deal with a large number of latent variables, which are all these subhalos. So, uh, so we use these the techniques that I was just describing, and here's an example where you see images coming in and the posterior uh, probability on the population level parameters being updated. Uh, and you see the posterior concentrating around the star, which was the true value that was used for this like mock data that we used to prototype the system. Okay, so, so that's one set of approaches. I just talked about these kind of neural network, uh, you know, uh, surrogate approach. The other approach is uh, where you use the simulator more efficiently uh, using things like probabilistic programming and, and active learning. Okay, so uh, probabilistic programming in that, in that uh, you know, chart was set, sat up here in the top right. But let me give you an example. So here is some program that's describing uh, randomly putting little bumpers around and dropping some balls and the balls are gonna bounce around. And because the program is random, you know, this is, uh, shows a, a little movie of three different executions of this, uh, of this program. And uh, because the, you know, it's, it's random, you, you can think of it as a probability distribution over programs, okay, like, or, or over executions of the program. And so if I think of it probabilistically, then I might want to do something like think of executions, like the posterior probability distribution. So ex executions of this program conditioned on something. And in this example, I want to condition on 20% of the balls landing in that bucket over there on the right. So if you just ran the program over and over again, you'd have to run it a lot of times to get you know, the balls to magically land in the, in the bucket on the right. And what probabilistic programming is doing is sort of biasing the execution of the simulator to make that happen. Um, and so that allows you to probe, uh, you know, distributions of what happened inside your simulator given some observation X. So we've uh, uh, been, you know, playing around with this recently for studying uh, jets at the LHC. Jets are these like big sprays of particles that hit the detector and they're very complicated objects. And we have a simulator for what jets look like. You know, it starts off with, you know, Feynman diagrams and then there's this thing called the parton shower followed by something called hadronization. And uh, the main point is that most of that evolution we don't see, that's like a, the latent process that we don't see. And all we observe are these like particles, the leaves of this tree that, you know, that hit our detectors. Um, and so we've used this probabilistic programming technique uh, to try to say, well, like, let me condition on something. Like, let me say, I'm only interested in jets that I have like less than seven particles or more than 27 particles. This is like a not very motivated example, but just imagine that. And then I want to say, okay, and I run the simulator and just give me the posterior probability, you know, like sh sh only execute uh, the simulator when I get, you know, less than seven or more than 27 particles. And um, if you wanted to do that by brute force, that would be very, very tough because the number of possible trees, like ways that this uh, 
you know, simulator can, can uh, evolve grows very, very rapidly. So if you had just 11 particles, there's something like 600 million trees uh, that, that can happen. So the latent space becomes very, very large and you're just not going to be able to like search it through brute force, right? But this probabilistic programming approach is allowing us to do that. Um, so roughly the way that works is that you're going to hijack the random numbers inside the simulator and try to bias the simulator through a sort of fancy form of importance sampling. Um, and while you might not know what's a good importance distribution to like draw from, uh, the, uh, we can use neural networks and things to try to learn what that should be. Um, and so that's, that's what we're doing basically. So before this had to be done in like special purpose languages, but what we've done recently is introduce a probabilistic programming execution protocol called PPX, which allows us to hijack the random numbers inside of a typical C++ simulator like particle physicists use, like uh, Sherpa is the example that we use. And then the inference algorithm sits on top and it can be in Python and it can just like reach inside and then control the random numbers of the simulator. So when we first prototype this, we use uh, this uh, particle physics, uh, physics simulator called Sherpa and we ran this on NERSC. Um, and this uh, was a paper that was nominated for best paper uh, at supercomputing 2019, and partially because it was just like at a scale that no one has really done probabilistic programming before. And these are some really like, you know, mammoth uh, neural networks that were being used and trained like, you know, at definitely like supercomputing scale. So I just thought I'd highlight that for this audience. Um, and most recently we've been uh, playing with this for that same strong lensing problem, where now instead of targeting the population parameters, we, we come in with an observed image and we're trying to infer you know, where were the subhalos and how much did they weigh and how offset was the galaxy from the line of sight of the, you know, the background galaxy and, and these kinds of things. So, uh, so this is a pretty cool technique and, uh, and definitely improves computational efficiency over the kind of naive approach by, you know, uh, parametrically. Um, and these things have also been used recently for uh, epidemiology and global health studies and things like that. And the same kind of tool, this probabilistic programming execution protocol is being used there, which is nice to see. Okay, the next thing that I'd like to switch to is this idea of active sciencing. So, you know, I talked about sort of simulation based inference techniques, uh, but there's also these other things that you might want to do, like you might want to uh, design an experiment or you might want some sort of feedback loop. Um, and, and often these experiments are going to be, you know, the pipelines are going to be complicated. So that's going to bring in ideas of workflows and things like that. And so I just want to talk about this kind of synthesis of these ideas. And this is very similar to what Katie was talking about just, uh, you know, an hour or two ago about trying to design, uh, you know, the where should the telescopes be, design the actual imaging apparatus with the problem that you have in mind. Um, and so it's sort of a, you know, end to end optimization type of mentality. So one example that happens a lot in particle physics is that we have some parameter space. So this is like an example parameter space. Uh, and we will do like a scan across the parameter space. So that's what these bl blue dots are like a grid scan over the parameter space. And for each one of these points, uh, we will want to run through some complicated, uh, you know, experimental uh, workflow or pipeline. Uh, and that's what's being illustrated here with a, you know, real world, you know, uh, uh, workflow for for like a, you know searching for beyond the standard model physics and the output of this workflow is basically going to be some number which is uh, going to essentially tell you is this theory point excluded or not and what you would like to do essentially is find you know the the contour that's the, the dividing line between what is excluded and what is allowed that's oftentimes like the money plot in these in these papers and so the the question here is is a grid scan really the right thing to do right you know you're going to, that you're generating all of this uh, simulated data a priori before you collect your data. And that just seems like the wrong thing to do. So we developed an algorithm that's kind of like a, a Bayesian optimization algorithm, but instead of trying to maximize a function, we're trying to find like the contour, the, the level set of some function. Um, and so what it does is it sort of intelligently decides where should you go run the simulator next uh, to save computing power. And what you see here is the quality of the contour as a function of the number of samples that had to, that ran through this pipeline. And you see, again, this is a logarithmic scale, that this active learning approach is like, you know, much more efficient than doing a grid or some kind of random sample. Um, and now that we're thinking about workflows, it's worth saying that, okay, well, let's say I want to optimize my experimental pipeline, right? Um, 
well, you know, end-to-end -end optimization is like all the thing and, and, uh, and you know, and, and AI and machine learning, but our workflows are challenging because they, they're not like running one thing on a GPU. They are very complicated scientific workflows that involve lots of different steps. And so we've recently been able to incorporate our workflows into like various workflow systems. And now what we're looking into is trying to make these uh, workflow systems be, uh, support automatic differentiation so that we can actually optimize complicated, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, experimental pipelines. So I think that's a pretty exciting uh, direction. Um, and then that ties into ideas where you might actually have feedback loops where there's sort of like in a reinforcement learning sense that you have an agent, which is like a scientist uh, that's deciding an action, which is like, what experiment should I do next? Or where should I point my telescope? Then they'll gather data, do some statistical analysis, update and repeat. And that's very much in keeping with what Mario was just talking about in terms of uh, his sort of vision for tomorrow um, and uh, these and the infrastructure needed to support this kind of uh, uh, this kind of uh, closed loop scientific uh, you know system. Okay, so the last topic that I want to uh, hit on real quick is uh, has to do with uh, improving sort of sample efficiency by putting inductive bias in the machine learning models. Okay, so inductive bias is this idea of like and putting the physics in the model and physics constraints and things like that. And the main topics that I think are sort of you know very interesting are the ideas of compositionality, there's symmetry, uh, the notions of causality and scale separation. And so there's no time to really go into all of that, but I would certainly say that, you know, a theme of a lot of my work recently has been, uh, you know, trying to figure out how to exploit our, our insight into the causal mechanism of what's going on in the physics uh, and incorporate that in some sort of, you know, architecture. And, uh, and so there's been a lot of work along those lines and Anima showed some very nice uh, work that way. Um, some of what we've done recently, for instance, is, uh, is thing called normalizing flows that you use for describing probability distributions. Oftentimes physics data sits on some low dimensional manifold in this higher dimensional space because we might have energy and momentum constraints or we might have various redundant uh, you know, uh, features in our data or various other things. And so together with Johan, we've worked on figuring out how to do the uh, you know, uh, model probability distributions that are restricted to manifolds and we call those inflows. And those scale up even to you know, talking about uh, you know, distributions of images of faces. And this is like a two dimensional manifold of faces sitting in some very high dimensional space of uh, images. Um, and then the last thing that I'll kind of highlight is has to do with uh, lattice uh, field theory. I've done, been doing some work with MIT and, and, uh, and DeepMind uh, where we want to model basically uh, what's going on with, uh, you know, configurations of quantum fields, you know, that are discretized on some lattice. And the way that that usually turn, you know, usually the way you describe that is a distribution over those configurations, where the distribution looks like e to the minus action, and the action you can compute from some Lagrangian that you, for your physical system. Um, but oftentimes in particle physics, these Lagrangians have symmetries associated to them, you know, uh, and, uh, and so we know that, for instance, if the action is invariant, to the, these transformations, these gauge transformations, then the probability should be constant in those directions. But how do we incorporate that into that knowledge into uh, a, a normalizing flow? So a, a typical normalizing flow will model some very complicated distribution like this, and we want it to look like this, where if you go in these sort of pure gauge degrees of freedom, the, the probability should be constant. The problem is the, the, it's not so easy to identify what these directions are. This is a very much a schematic picture. Um, but we figured out now how to like, you know, after a lot of work, uh, incorporate these kinds of symmetries uh, into uh, uh, normalizing flows. And what we get out is that if you compare to something like a Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, that gets basically stuck in one configuration or another for a long time, these flow based techniques are able to explore the uh, the configuration space much more efficiently, um, and that uh, saves you know dramatically in terms of uh, computational time. Um, and some similar things have been done uh, using normalizing flows, not for lattice field theory, but for molecular um, <clears throat> uh, 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 you know molecular physics and things like this, where you're trying to look at, for instance, proteins that might be in or molecular dynamics was the I was looking for, where you're trying to look for proteins, for instance, that might be in different metastable states, um, uh, like this, you know, this configuration, this configuration. If you try to have a Markov chain explore and, and transition from one state to another, it takes a very, very long time. But these normalizing flow uh, techniques are speeding that up uh, dramatically. 
So, um, so that's pretty much what I wanted to highlight. Um, I know I'm talking fast, apologies about that. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll end with this point again that uh, absolutely we should throw more computing at it and absolutely we should take advantage of new computing architectures, but we should also remember that uh, uh, oftentimes we can do just be uh, reduce the computational demands by, you know, you know, thinking and being clever, but that still require. It's not necessarily just like uh, you know some new technique. It often requires also uh, reaching into the software and and integrating the computing and the software and the methodology you know very deeply to be able to see those gains. And I'll end with that. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Kyle. It is uh, fascinating that the type of things we can do if we really think through what we can do instead of just throwing the kitchen sink at the problem. All right, so anyone with questions? All right, I'll, I'll ask a question. Um, thanks, Kyle, for coming, um, staying so late. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, I had a question about um, your the differential, let's say, analysis, like the, the differential optimization, right? So, um, you know, it, you're kind of hinting that, you know, you can kind of automate a whole analysis or like, you know, some of the big chunks of an analysis is, is how you divide all your, or do your categorizations. Um, and, you know, this differential programming is, is kind of a nice way to do this. And I guess, um, you know, my concerns always are, uh, how well can you embed like systematics and stuff when you do this optimization? Um, Cause yeah. yeah, right. Go ahead. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Uh, I mean, it's applicable. It's like a, it's a very important question. So I think that, um, so one, you know, there's, you know, it's systematics are, there's many forms, but to the extent that there's sort of two rough uh, approaches to dealing to those uncertainties, one are kind of data-driven type of approaches uh, where, uh, where you might, uh, you know, for instance, not know a background, but you might try to find a background rich area and extrapolate it to, to the signal region or something. Um, and then there's, you know, approaches where you think uh, your simulator is not known perfectly or your calibration constants aren't known perfectly. And you have essentially a recipe for varying uh, you know, the, the, the nuisance parameters of your simulator around and kind of, you know, propagating that through to the end. So, um, so the, for the former, what's interesting in this example is actually includes uh, this, uh, it includes a data-driven approach. So there are, there, there's a, a signal type region and a background, well, a signal plus background type region and a background only type region in this picture and it divides it into sort of two different bins. And, and what it's doing here is it's essentially trying to estimate the background from one and propagate it into the other. And that entire propagation procedure is incorporated in the statistical model and, uh, and is being, you know, sort of, and so then the question is like, okay, well, what region, you know, what's the best region to use for my, my background rich area? So in that sense, it's certainly compatible with it. Um, th th that's, you know, those approaches still bring with them some uh, various assumptions. So you can kind of just keep kicking this, you know, question down the road. So there's still going to be, I think, humans involved in saying like this, this algorithm for constructing, you know, the, the template of what the analysis looks like, I think is, is valid. And now just go optimize it within that class of analysis templates, you know. Um, so it's a good question. The, the other approach where you have like systematics that come from simulators that you essentially have a recipe for varying things up and down, like there's really no reason, if it's a recipe, there's really no reason for it not to just be incorporated in the workflow itself, right? So I guess, you know, roughly the answer is people are still gonna need to worry about systematics, but they might be able to start modeling the question on like a higher level and then optimize within that. Yeah, and the varying the up and down, you can kind of naturally embed into, the, into this, right? I mean yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, in this kind of, you know, you can imagine some of these nodes in this big workflow are basically just run it again with, you know, jet energy scale varied by, you know, some amount or something. I mean, I, I would think you'd want to, like the jet energy scale variations like embedded and you don't even need to rerun it, right? Um, but, but yeah, it de depends on how you model those things, but yeah. yeah, I I would, yeah. I just, I, it's more I'm just trying to understand, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Sure. I'll on that slide, uh, this is Tom Gibbs from NVIDIA. Kyle, good talk. Uh, good to good to see you again. Um, the, have you looked at the um, you know what the reduction in the number of runs was for this workflow here? In other words, you know the normal would be a hundred run a uh, hundred samples you'd have to do, and you might be able to reduce it by a factor of ten. Or do you, is there a way to get a handle on that? 
Yeah, that's what this plot is showing here is kind of compared to the grid. There's some notion of you know, quality of the contour. So it also depends on what kind of tolerance you have on the quality of the contour. And then you see, you know, like uh, in terms of, you know, number of runs. So if you want to get up here, if, you know, if you have a threshold like this, what is that, like 40 samples in here, it's, you know, I don't know, it's like a factor of two, but that's for this particular example and it depends and it scales rapidly with dimensionality. So we have some examples where the parameter space is more like five dimensional and there, then you start seeing like more orders of magnitude type of improvement. So it's, Definitely problem specific. Sure. Yeah, that, that's really interesting for a number of the problems that are kind of resistant to being parallelized, um, but they're really like the Giant is an example, right? That's a tough simulation to optimize. So being yeah. able to reduce the number of times you have to run it um, and then maybe use surrogates and some of these other, that, yeah, sampling the, uh, the random number generators from those, those simulations to basically get the contours of really, uh, very interesting approach. Yeah. It's funny. Cause I mean, it's also requires a major change in how the collaborations work because we're very used to this, uh, generate this ahead of time and then collect the data and then compute the contour. And the idea that you're going to, you know, say, you know, because there's a latency <laughs> issue, right? <laughs> you know, the nice part is yeah. once you you're, you settled on your pipeline, you you know, it's, you can kind of, it's relatively fast to get the contour. The expensive part was sort of generating the data for all these blue points. But the, uh, in this approach, you know, you have to wait longer for the answer. There's a latency involved, but uh, but in terms of total compute, you, you win substantially. Yeah, but you could use a surrogate model to create all the points on the previous chart, right? And maybe they don't have to be that accurate. They just have to be accurate enough. And then, right? Yeah. yeah. No, that's, yeah, there's a whole separate side of this where you have the kind of hierarchy of simulators, right? Where you first do a, a quick pass with a cheap simulator and then, a, and then a more expensive pass to try to nail down the contour, you know, with a, with a better simulator. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating. Well, thank you. It's fun to watch. <laughs> yeah. So, Kyle, where do you see the, the future in, oh. in terms of um, what you're doing right now for particle physics? And I see that you're trying to do translational research as well. Where do you see the future in terms of AI uh, for the particle physics community in the next few years? What will be the main challenges? where people need to be innovative beyond what we have right now? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I would say, I mean, one of the parts that's happening is that all of the ideas that have piled up over the last few years are, you know, at various levels of people being convinced <laughs> and, and starting to deploy, but there's still a pretty big, uh, you know, gap between really deploying these and particle physics experiments um, uh, and, so, and like integrating it into like a, you know, our frameworks and things like that. So I think, you know, a lot of the effort is going to be, you know, putting that into, into practice and then also starting to see all the places where these things that were prototyped on simple examples break, you know, uh, and then also all of the like uh, sociological issues that are going to emerge in terms of, uh, you know, people being able to trust or not trust these things. And, uh, and that, you know, I think that's all, healthy because you know uh, you know a lot of the pushback is not just old curmudgeons that don't like things but they're sometimes good questions about how do you you know how do you control systematics and things like that so i guess that will be one part of it and then the the other part it's it's not the only you know it's not the only thing but i, I do feel like this transition from a mindset where we're using deep neural networks everywhere to actually the if we want to incorporate all of our physics into these uh, deep neural networks, maybe the faster way to get there is to just use the algorithms that we already had and make them be differential, you know, um, you know, because, you know, what's the point of taking like a, an algorithm that you have and incorporating it into, you know, some graph neural network or something. If once you're done, it basically looks like the algorithm that you started with. It's just you can backdrop through it, right? So, um, so I think that this idea of revisiting, like, where do we really need neural networks and where can we uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, incorporate differentiable programming into our existing like approaches is going to be like a, an important thing for us to consider. And there are some places where like, you know, neural networks really are like a better fit for the job or the techniques that we've been using are kind of too simple. 
Uh, but uh, but I think in many places, really, the, the gain is more from, you know, automatic differentiation. Okay, thanks a lot. Well, I think this has been a pretty good day in terms of listening to the community. Uh, we encourage you to attend tomorrow. Uh, we start at 10 a.m. Central Time. So if you have the time, um, please join us. There will be a, a very interesting panel discussion to begin the day. Um, so... Looking forward to the discussions tomorrow. Thank you for your participation.